I am calling the meeting of the Committee on Outreach, Communications, and Appointments to order at 9.37 a.m. Uh, you have a number of items in your packet today. Um, there are two agendas. One is the agenda um, that was the public posting. The other is uh, an agenda that says uh, agenda 2019-923, and then in brackets for meeting. Um, it is just a slightly more detailed agenda, but that's probably the one you will have in front of you today. Um, so first thing is announcements. So first announcement is we have our min a minute taker. Um, I sent an email to Phyllis, who's been our volunteer minute taker for several months on uh, uh, last week, uh, thanking her for her service to our committee, which I think we can all agree was a really uh, great service as we navigated some really difficult decisions. Um, and so I think we're all very grateful for everything that Phyllis did for us. Um, and I hope that she spends her Monday mornings doing something slightly more fun uh, from now on. Um, Alyssa, Alyssa mentioned uh, we might want to briefly discuss how we want to do minutes. Um, so the process thus far has been that Phyllis would send them uh, to George or Darcy, or was it just George? Either one of us. Had what, either George or Darcy, um, and they would sort of clean them up, fix them, um, put them in a packet, and then uh, I as chair would approve them. Um, we can continue that practice, or we could have the minutes just sent to me as chair, um, and, and, and I could approve them, or we could go back to actually having the committee review and vote on minutes. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but is there any preference for that going forward since we do have a, a new minute taker? Yes, Sarah. I feel like just having you have them sent to you and you doing them is more expedient. I think it makes the minutes show up quicker, so I'm all for that. Okay. Other thoughts? What she said. Alyssa Darcy. I think I'm fine with that. Um, so you, the minutes would be sent to you and then what? Uh, so the minutes would be sent to me for review and, and approval before they would go um, in the approved minutes packet. So why don't we just have them go to the whole committee That's, and then, could do that too. And then um, if we don't have objections and you approve them, then they're approved. But it seems like at some point they should go to us, right? At, and we don't say anything, then it's, it's assumed that we approve them. Does that oh. make sense? Yeah. Alyssa? So there are various legal options associated with this, and the one that we've been using is different than the one that the full town council uses in that we've had Phyllis is reviewed, as Evan said, by either of you or George, and then Evan was approving them, and they were considered done, and they were not coming back to the committee like they had at the very beginning, because we'd come up with this more streamlined process. I would suggest that at least as we get our feet under us, because we know how difficult it was, even though Phyllis had taken minutes for hundreds of different <laughs> committees over the years um, that weren't open meeting law required minutes, just till we all get familiar with what the new process is, that if it, they get sent from Martha to you and then you send them out to us, just or she can send them to us, whichever way you wanna do it, but then you tell us what the deadline is. Okay. Like, I'm gonna approve these on such and such date unless you see there's something wrong with them and then they'll go in our packet, right? right and then you'll also give them to staff in Paul's right. office to ensure they show up on the website that's still kind of a funky thing in right. terms of how stuff gets up there. So, so I like that. So what we'll do is I'll have them sent to me and then I will share them with the committee and say, I will look them over, I'll give them a, a cursory look, change anything that I think um, maybe needs to be changed, send them out to the committee and say these minutes will be considered approved unless you offer corrections by X date. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Okay, so we will do that. And I, and I will admit, um, I have, we have a little bit of a backlog in minutes getting uploaded onto the website that's on my to-do list for this week. Because um, if you look at the OCA meeting on the town website, 
um, we do need to get some more recent minutes up there, so I will be working on that this week. Uh, the second announcement we have is that there is a vacancy on the ZBA. Uh, we had one resignation from the ZBA, um, and so there's a current vacancy. Uh, I wrote and the town posted a vacancy announcement uh, as required by the charter uh, that was posted to the town bulletin board on September 12th. And so per the charter, that vacancy um, has to be posted for no less than 14 days. So we are still in that 14 day period. Um, we are not going to be discussing this vacancy today or what we're gonna do about it, that it will be on the agenda for October 7th, which will be after that 14 day period. So um, right now we have the vacancy notice up. After that 14 day period, we'll meet on October 7th um, to discuss how we want to proceed and what our options are with regard to that vacancy on the ZBA. With that, I want to move on to uh, agenda item three, which is discussion and vote on appointments to multiple member bodies filed by the town manager. There are three appointments the uh, three sets of appointments. The registers are uh, register of voters. Uh, we are going to vote and act on that today um, and then provide an oral report to the council tonight because the council is expected to act on register of voters at tonight's meeting. The other two are CDBG Advisory Committee and Water Supply Protection Committee. Uh, my intention is for our committee to vote on them today, um, but those won't go before the council until October 7th and will be accompanied by an oral report. So because uh, it's slightly more pressing, let's look at Registrar of Voters first. You have the town manager's memo in your packet. Uh, the town manager will be joining us uh, in a few minutes, um, so he will be here to answer any questions we might have, but if we wanna take a minute to at least look at these over now um, and discuss whether we have any questions for the town manager. So we're starting with Registrar of Voters. There are two candidates, a three-year term for Demetria Shabazz and a two-year term for Jacqueline Gardner. Questions, comments? George? I believe the church, um, I don't know if it requires having members of two different, of the two parties uh, mem as, right? I believe it's a requirement, but what we learn here is that the party has never responded. So does that basically mean that the, um, anyone can be placed without, uh, or yeah, I don't know. Alyssa? I do. <laughs> I was hoping you did. Me, 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 me. So, um, as we all know, the charge documents have many shortcomings, so it's not at all surprising that it's perhaps difficult to interpret what it says versus what is on the appointment thing. It's state law that your board of registrars has to have a mix of the political parties that are in your community with some parity. So as was stated in the town manager's report, there's a Republican continuing on, yeah. and so we needed Democrats to fill the other seats. We could not have just filled them with Republicans because we thought they were really great candidates because of the way our town voter registration is, which is obviously, yeah. based on anyone who knows Amherst, incredibly high like Democrat re uh, registrations. And of course, there's not a category for unenrolled folks, and so it's the major political parties, and I've not heard of anything requiring green representation, for example. Mm -hmm. But what the part that makes it confusing is, is differently than the 14-day notice that Evan just described associated with the charter, and which was, is not a state law, right? The 14-day notice on ZBA is part of our charter. It has nothing to do with state law. State law does decide that for registrar of voters, you have to have Democrats and Republicans, and it also says you have to reach out to those committees because every single municipality in Massachusetts has a Democratic town committee and a Republican town committee. That doesn't mean they're functioning. That doesn't mean their post office box even works, but there are such things, and in fact, they, re they elect people to serve at their, as official members on our ballots every so often. You might recall that on our local ballots, we're like, oh yeah, what's that? It's that. Um, but that letter has to go out. So what this means is, once again, unsurprisingly, 
both the Republican Party in whatever shape it's in in Amherst and the Democratic Party, which has actually had some activity, but also frequently doesn't respond to the request, doesn't respond, so they had first crack at making nomination. Mm -hmm. And since they didn't, there, then there's that period, that's what Paul was describing in the memo. Now I can move forward because they didn't respond, but he's not allowed when he has a vacancy to just decide. But that is unfortunately typically what happens in Amherst is neither one of those organizations has been particularly well organized over the last several years in terms of responding to that letter. So that's why it's just like this extra layer of stuff that's not related to the charter and is unlike every other committee we have. Other questions or comments on Register of Voters? No? So why don't we open... I want to look at all three of these so we have the chance to ask the town manager any questions while mm -hmm. he's here and then we'll vote them after. Uh, why don't we open CDBG Advisory? Comments, questions? Alyssa? I just want to emphasize that process-wise, we are getting, we are working on getting more consistent about when we get these reports that they include both the vacancy notice and, well, the charge was already there as we discussed at a previous meeting, then adding the vacancy, then adding the reappointment information. So as we've talked about before in terms of like more of a checklist modality associated with these things, we may eventually come up with such a thing to remind ourselves of what was all the things we asked for but those appear to be all the things we've asked so for. So the revised notice appears to comply with all the things that we've all agreed to at this meeting with Paul in the past. Yes, so we have the, the memo, the charge, and the vacancy posting. Questions, comments on CDBG advisory? I guess I just have a question about um, it looks like um, Gail Lang Lansky um, was on the interview team, mm -hmm. and she was also a candidate. Mm -hmm. So I think we had talked about that before. Is my give the town manager a chance to respond, Paul? Yes. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so we only interviewed new candidates. So as chair of the CDBG advisory committee, she was on the interview team. We don't, and she was up for reappointment. So we, I don't, she wasn't interviewing herself, obviously. Um, <laughs> so she was there to interview the new appointment. And you'll notice, you'll start to see these more frequently. I was tr always trying to keep a complete, you know, have you have a complete list for you, but, um, some people will, couldn't come in for this, and, and rather than hold on a couple appointments, I want to, you'll, you'll see another one coming back for CDBG, which I apologize for, but I think it's, um, it, it's becoming a, sort of a, um, a puzzle now, putting people on different committees, and so we'll put some names forward, and then you'll have another one on CDBG for another name at some point in time, so I think that's, rather than hold on until everything is set up, let these people know that they've been appointed. Dusty, did you have a follow-up? No, I just thought that was one of the things that we had asked uh, asked about earlier, but I'm not clear. <laughs> I'm not clear on it myself. So, so we have, as a committee, discussed um, two things. One is um, whether or not to have chairs sit in on interviews um, when they are up for reappointment, um, and then the other is whether or not a um, people who are up for reappointment are interviewed themselves. Uh, there's been some discussion, but no agreement in this group. Um, but the town manager has made his process clear to us. And so any discussion or decision we have um, can only be advisory at best at this point. Alyssa, you had? 
the third, I believe the third part to that that we'd express concern about, but again, not agreement, right, is um, just as we didn't on those first two, is the idea of are there really vacancies if you're just going to reappoint people? So why are you advertising vacancies when it's a known quantity that you're going to reappoint? Because that doesn't seem like you, in my opinion, that doesn't seem like you're advertising an accurate number of vacancies if your every intention is to appoint, including by the obvious scenario of having one of the people who's up for reappointment being one of the deciders in terms of not decider because the town manager's the decider, but having significant influence over the decision. But I think that we came to the conclusion, as Evan stated, that while we had mixed opinions on this, we were not with one voice, even here at OCA, that it didn't really matter what we thought mm -hmm. because it was the town manager's appointment process, but it was something we would keep in mind for our process as well, because we've talked about how our process, as it changes, will serve as hopefully an example of other things we'd like to see in the town manager's process, but that doesn't mean we can force him to change it. So I appreciate that you brought it up because I continue to have uneasiness about this and I don't want it to just be like, well, it's his decision, so I'm no longer uneasy about it. I'm still gonna be uneasy about it, but the reality is under the charter, it is still his decision and that's just one of the things we're coping with as we move forward with our process to see if we do the same thing with ZBA and planning board next time we do appointments. Mr. So, Lockerman. So the only reason, uh, one of the reason, important reasons to include someone from the committee itself, otherwise it's staff making the decisions plus someone from the residence advisory committee who might not know anything about the committee. So having the chair, I think, I feel having the chair, whoever the existing chair is present for the interviews is an important way to communicate with what's what the, what, the committee, what the expectations of the committee are. Alyssa? Again, I will follow up because we're kind of just rewinding our entire conversation having had that before because what that didn't just say is what I have said before, which is the fact that here at this body, we decided not to have those chairs present. So it's absolutely not true that if they're not there, that then it depends entirely on staff and RAC. We asked them what their opinions were before we went in to the interview and so you could either have a different member that isn't up for reappointment, which would also be weird, or you could get their opinion ahead of time, like we did with ZBA and Planning Board. It's, it's not factual that there wouldn't be any information because we, in fact, got information that we wrote down and provided to people from the chairs. It's a different process. I obviously think it's a superior process, but it isn't that <laughs> it's impossible to do it without the chair there because we did it without the chair there. And, and we should note that all of these discussions were summarized in our August 19th OCA report to the council with some detail. So that, that report and those, those discussions is public. The council has it. Um, perhaps at some point they might offer their input on these things since uh, I think OCA has discussed these ad nauseum. Um, mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments on CDBG Advisory Committee? Okay, then why don't we look at Water Supply Protection Committee. This is the third and final set of appointments the town manager filed uh, in time for today's meeting. There are five people, three of which are reappointments. Questions, comments on CDBG advisory? Water supply. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alyssa? On water oh, supply? Water Supply yeah. Protection Committee. Thank you. Is so many right? things, and I know if I look at text and then I say the text even if I'm not intending to. Um, <laughs> the only thing I was going to bring up is something that's absolutely not under our control, which is that the people with the, the Water Supply Protection Committee was one of the few committees that was really intended when it was first created, because you know I was there, when it, for specific expertise in areas. And what that lends itself to is uh, you know, not a very big pool of people out in the world who have that kind of expertise and we're really fortunate that we can get people with that expertise to serve on this committee and to serve in this role. What's a little complicated about that is because almost all the people in that field, as I'm sure um, our DPW staff would say, are men. And so we have a real diversity issue associated with this particular committee but that's because it has an expertise and the field is what the field is. And so I, 
I, I feel unhappy about that, but that's you know a, a windmill we can't, how can we address? Because we aren't going to pick someone who doesn't have that set of qualifications merely because they're not a white guy. But on the other hand, I know that must make people somewhat uncomfortable and it obviously skews our statistics, but the importance of the set of skills. And so I don't know that there is more outreach to be given, but I would assume that Amy would tell you if there was more outreach to be done because of her expertise and the fact that she is one of the few women in this Commonwealth that has the level of expertise she does, that other people, if they had water supply com committees, would be grabbing her to be on. Mr. Balcom. So, so the, <coughs> the staff person who supports us is a woman. Um, the two new appointments are both women right. to the committee. So I think um, even though I think you identified the, the um, gender specificness of this of the applicant pool, I'm really proud of the two that are moving forward who are very well qualified. Mm -hmm. Further questions or comments on Water Supply Protection Committee? No? All right, so we've looked at all three. Are there any uh, final questions or comments for the town manager before he leaves us? Darcy? I just have an unrelated question that I want to ask before you leave and just about it's whether- It's related to OCA though? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to ask if you are thinking of uh, opening up of, um, the application process for the Refuse and Recycling Committee? Not at this point. What, what's, do you have a plan? Um, that committee has, has been relatively dormant for a while, and um, what its purpose is, I think, needs a more thorough discussion about what, what their role in is. So I think somewhat if, I'm not sure if ECAC is thinking about refuse as part of their charge in terms of uh, global warming and all that stuff, but, um, but I don't have a real plan for that committee at this point in time. There are no issues pending or coming up other than the solid waste uh, master plan that was presented to the select board a couple years ago now. Well, it seems like there are a lot of issues pending, a lot of interest in the community about, you know, trash hauling and composting and, mm -hmm. And you know, there's the zero waste um, issue that's just kind of hanging. The it was presented to the select board, and they put it off to, to the new form of government. And so there's a whole plan out there ready to go. Um, so I'm hoping that that will, you know, that will will reconstitute that committee. Okay. Alyssa. And, and I can appreciate both those points of view because I have seen it be relatively dormant and it is in a different place than when the transfer station was much more active and it had you know, different rules about what was able to do there and yet also appreciating what you're saying about all the other ongoing and upcoming issues. Um, the fact that we no longer had Susan Wade as a part-time employee who was particularly affiliated with the group and all the educational efforts they did was one of the reasons it, it struggled a little bit to, because we didn't have an employee that way, assigned that way anymore, although obviously other people are covering some of the basics. But the plan, just to be clear, that they came up with was not adopted by the select board. So in terms of being put off and in terms of saying the plan's ready, it's ready based on the opinions of the Recycling and Refuse Management Committee. And so I guess the question that that then leads me to based on what you guys have just said is, a timeline that just given all the other things that are on all the plates of when we might see that again and how the town manager envisions talking to the council about that versus and, and perhaps becoming part of another committee's charge or whether it's council committee or a non-council committee like ECAT or if it's something that's going to be done, a decision that's going to be made in isolation of continued discussion with the town council whereas because the different change in government, right? If, if we hadn't changed governments, eventually the select board would have been a little bit engaged in that. I don't know if the expectation is that the town council will be at all engaged in that moving forward. And again, we've all got a million things going mm -hmm. on. So I don't know what's even a realistic timeline to expect. I know some people like wanted to do it yesterday, but 
maybe just getting a sense of, to be able to say, go talk to Paul, and he's thinking about six months from now, I think would be more useful than just not knowing. Sure. Did you have another comment, Alexa? I thought your hand was up before Darcy talked, but perhaps I was incorrect. I would love to move on. So on our delightful um, and, and much appreciated report that you wrote for us that's in the town council packet tonight that was based on our CAF conversation at Correct. our last meeting. Correct. Because that's not up for any discussion tonight. Uh, I mean, it'll be part of the committee reports, right? But it's not up for, it's not an agenda item for discussion Correct. tonight at town council. Um, not knowing, because we didn't get to that part of the agenda yet, if that's what we're planning for the 7th, um, that the town council will start to talk about that because you, we had requested a vote Correct. from the town council for that. And I just wondered why we had the town manager here, if now is the time to ask him if he had any thoughts that would help inform our discussion associated with that because we had that conversation without sure. him previously. If he has. Do you have any idea what we're talking about? Yeah, I, <coughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, so, so br briefly, because I know you do have another meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, last week, Oka devoted the majority of its meeting to talking about CAF's mm -hmm. potential improvements or visions to CAF's. Um, and one of the discussion points we had was uh, regarding sort of the um, different issues that we faced uh, when it came to CAF's for planning board, ZBA finance, and those um, that the town council appoints with regard to when we got them, uh, when interviews were scheduled, uh, information that we would have liked to see that wasn't there. Um, and that discussion concluded um, with a vote from this committee um, to recommend that uh, the CAF for uh, finance planning board and ZBA be separated mm -hmm. from the rest of them so that there is a CAF, it, at this point would be identical, but a CAF for all town, town manager appointed committees and a CAF for the town council appointed committees mm -hmm. um, so that if you want to apply for one of those three, you click this link and those CAFs would then, um, much like they were with this like board, be automatically distributed to all councilors. Um, so we saw CAFs as they came in so that we would have the full pool. Um, that was a vote we took uh, to recommend that the town council vote mm -hmm. that, to do that. And that's Thoughts. totally doable and easily to do and highly re you know, recommended as well. So okay. that'd be great. Yeah. All right, well with that, I'm going to release the town great. manager. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, and let's do these. Uh, appointments. So why don't we start with the Register of Voters. George? Let me practice. So I'm going to try and practice and, and correct me if I may. I want to move that OCA recommend that the Town Council approve the following Town Manager appointments to the Registrar of Voters. For a three-year term, Demetria Shabazz. I can spell that if it would help. Or Why don't you read it off the okay. motion sheet for town council tonight, which she can just copy and paste from tonight's town council motion sheet rather than you having to worry about. And I don't have the motion sheet in front of me. I'll pull it up right now. Are you supposed to practice making a motion? I'm oh, practicing making oh, a motion. Oh, 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 sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so, and you can correct me, I don't mind. But um, so for three year term, Demetria Shabazz, S H A B A Z Z. For a two-year term, Jacqueline Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E the only, uh, is there a second? I'll second if you have a second. Sorry. Um, Three-year term for Demetria Shabazz expires June 30, 2022. The two-year term for Jacqueline Gardner expires June 30, 2022. 21. Okay, so we have a, a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, with that I'll call the question. All those in favor, raise your hands and say aye. 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 That's unanimous. So, let's look at CDVG 
Advisory Committee. George, would you like to make a motion? I'm going to try again. I move that OCA recommend that the Town Council approve the following uh, Town Manager appointments to the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, CDBG, for a three-year term to expire June 30, 2022, Gail Lansky, L-A-N-S-K-Y, for a two-year term, expiring June 30, 2021, Stephanie Leon Bruno, L-E-O-M-B-R-U-N-O. -E There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Alyssa, do you have a an, an edit? I know you do. I just want to ensure the dates are in there beyond that. I don't know what I just missed because honestly, I'm looking for our document from August that you probably could have just told me where it was because I'm thinking about our next conversation. So if uh, it has the dates and everything, I'm good. The only thing it doesn't have that I, I believe, the only thing it doesn't have that I believe we usually put in is the reappointment. So, George? I'm sorry? Uh, Well, this isn't on tonight's motion sheet because this is this one's for action. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the only the only thing I would ask to be added is to specify that Gail Lansky's a reappointment, which we've been doing in the past. Ah, Gail Lansky's a reappointment. Thank you. Accept that. It's even written there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's a mo there's a, so George moves. Who seconded? You did. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, any further discussion, Alyssa? Can the minutes reflect that this is what happens when you have a huge retreat on a Saturday after a block party on Thursday, a breakfast on a Friday? A re you know, we're a little under-caffeinated at this point. I think you did a great job, George. I'm, I'm we are time. almost I'm, there. I'm it's awesome. <laughs> All right. So with that, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. And so let's turn to Water Supply Protection Committee. Would anyone like to make a motion? George. Ready, Alyssa? I'm ready. Thank you, dear. I move that OCA recommend that the Town Council approve the following Town Manager appointments to the Water Supply Protection Committee for a three-year term to expire June 30, 2022. Linda Arsenault, A-R-S-E-N-A-U-L-T. Anna Martini, M-A-R-T-I-N-I. And John Tobiason, T-O-B-I-A-S-O-N. His is a reappointment. Do you think I should? Thank you. Thank you. John Tobiason, reappointment. Thank you, Alyssa. For a two year term to expire. To put, no, I just did a three year term. Thank you. Yes, he did. This isn't easy, folks. You're doing great. Just keep Thank going. You. I, I'm, I'm trying. For a two-year term to expire June 30, 2021, Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S, Witten, W-I-T-T-E-N, reappointment. Brian Yellen, Y-E-L-L-E-N, reappointment. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Sarah seconded. Is there any further discussion? Alyssa. Although you do read with wonderful diction, George, in terms of how people's names are spelled. That's not a practice we need to no, use going no, forward. No. We'll ensure that Martha has right. a copy of no, all the our agenda materials no. so she can just copy and paste. So if anybody makes a mistake in a name, it just can get so just read promulgated every time rather than you, because you're really good at that. No, no, no. Maybe I, not I, force us you. to do that. Thank you. Great. Further discussion? All right, call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 
and that's unanimous. Okay, so again, uh, the town council tonight is only going to be taking up registrar of voters. I will give a very brief uh, oral report on that. Um, the other two will be in a written report to council for October 7th, which is when they're expected to act on those. Alyssa. I'm sorry to be a pest, but I, and I know I'm feeling like one already this morning, is the, I'm not sure we need a written report for the other two either, unless you're going to tell me what it's going to have in it that would be any different than your verbal report tonight for Board of Registrars, because I really appreciate the way we staggered that in case we'd had some big discussion because we didn't know what would come out of our discussion, but since what came out of our discussion was nothing substantive in terms, I would like to just see our report be, here's what the motions were that George read so beautifully, and here's that report from August that talked about the same things we just went over, because yeah. that was exactly the, kind of the conversation we had all over again about chairs, et cetera. And so I don't see that there's any need to write anything more than that in the report, and so I'm trying to make it easier for you, but I also, unless there's something else you were thinking that yeah. you wanted to share with us needs to be in there, I feel like it's literally just the motions and that previous report like, CC, remember how we told you this? That, that was my intention, was the latter. I want to have a written report. Um, I, I, I think that it's nice for counselors to know before they're about to vote how OCA voted on this. Mm -hmm. um, but my intention is it will likely be like a half page report. Um, and, and I can attach that report from before. Yes, okay. I can do it. But yes, otherwise the new information would be very short. But I do want them to know before they have to vote, <laughs> or seconds before. Um, okay, so with that, we will move on to agenda item four. So this is a continuation of what was going to be a discussion over the next uh, several meetings, over the next several months, about a revised process to recommend appointments to multiple member bodies that are appointed by the town council. We opened that discussion last week with a discussion of community activity forms. Uh, I expressed my desire earlier to sort of structure our discussion um, through the process by which someone goes from becoming an applicant to an appointed member of a committee. The first step is they apply. Uh, we, uh, we will request from the town council in the near future uh, that CAFs are uh, separated out for town council committees and sent immediately to us. Once we have them, um, we have uh, a decision to make, which is when does this committee decide that we move forward? Um, and so to date, because town manager staff have been in control of all of the CAFs, uh, the practice to date has been that the town manager staff receives the CAFs and then decides when to move forward and schedules interviews, and we never saw the applicant pool until after interviews were already scheduled. Uh, under this new system in which we, we receive the CAFs, we will know the entire pool from the beginning. Uh, what that means is we have a little bit more control over deciding whether or not we should move forward. Sometimes that might be a timing issue, um, but sometimes it might not be. Um, and then ideally, we wouldn't move forward because we absolutely have to because of some time constraint. We'd be able to look at the pool and say, do we want to move forward? Uh, with interviews, do we want to maybe hold off and do some more recruiting? And so I wanted to have a discussion first about any thoughts we had on once we get all these applications and we start thinking about do we want to move on to the next stage of interviews, um, how do we look at the pool as to whether we feel the pool is sufficient to move forward? Is that something we even have to look at? Perhaps we decide, you know what, the pool is the pool and we don't even decide whether it's too big, too small, or, or whatnot. We just go anyway because we have to make appointments. Um, so maybe we don't even have to consider it, but I wanted this committee to have some discussion on assessing the pool and, and how we make a decision about whether it's time to move forward to interviews. Um, to sort of start us off, I did add to the packet a couple discussion questions. I think there's only like Three, these are obviously not everything we probably want to talk about, um, but it's 4A in your packet, discussion questions regarding sufficient applicant pool for town council appointments. Um, so I will open the floor to any comments um, or discussion on this aspect. Thoughts? Sarah. So I think it probably goes without saying that um, 
when we look at some committees when we get applications, if there's like, if there are three positions open and we have two or three people, obviously we would want to recruit again. I also think that it would be a good policy for us to be able to have that question be brought up for us to either tick the box or say that we wanted to recruit um, simply simply because I think it's important to us to make sure that we have a diversity, we've talked about a diversity of gender, of backgrounds, and we're also an outreach committee, so I think that part of our job is to take a look at how outreach has been going. Are there thoughts on this generally or are in response to any of the three questions on the discussion question sheet? Darcy? I, th I think that, um, you know, it would be kind of artificial to have a particular number of CAFs received. Um, but I agree with Sarah that, that uh, you know, if we, if we have maybe this, the number of, of, of applicants as seats that we probably should reach out again to see if, if we can recruit some others. Um, I think that a lot of times we're going to, it's going to have to be like a holistic process and that we're gonna be, you know, it'll be different for each committee because it's more important to get people with specific skills for certain committees than with other committees. So um, I think it's gonna be hard, hard to have like a very hard and fast rules and numbers about, um, requirements for how we're going to do this. I think we're gonna to have to do it somewhat holistically. Okay. George? I agree with Darcy that hard and fast rules are gonna be hard to come by. It sounds like for number one, though, it might be something, if not a hard and fast rule, maybe it would be useful to express, if we come to an agreement, that we would expect there, there would be at least one more uh, applicant uh, than vacancies. So we'd expect at least more than one. Is that, or even that doesn't, I mean, just as an expectation, as opposed to just leaving it uh, unstated. Because I share with you the sense that if you have vacancies, I mean, again, we're only talking essentially about three bodies here. Correct. And these are at least two, if not all three, are somewhat, you know, they have, they could be contentious. Um, we've just uh, appointed a number of people to, uh, we've appointed a number of people to three committees today that I don't think um, would raise a great deal of um, uh, political contention within the community. But these appointments, I think, can. So the thought that we're appointing people and um, to vacancies, and we only have the exact number of candidates that there are vacancies, I think would be troubling. I may not be troubled by that with other committees, or at least some of them, but with these, I think I would be. So um, I, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm wondering if there's any sense from the committee that we would at least have the expectation that would be more applicants than, at least one more applicant than um, vacancies. And if we didn't have that, that would be either um, something that we would be seriously, we'd have to address or we'd, uh, yeah. Right, and I can speak here. I should say, you know, when I was writing this question, I said there should there be a threshold number I never anticipated like a hard and fast number for every committee, mm -hmm. which is why I put relative to number of vacancies. So the idea being, if there are, do we always wanna make sure that we have at least the number of applicants as we do vacancies? Or do we always wanna make sure we have at least, as George said, one more applicant than vacancies, or two more applicants than vacancies? Mm -hmm. Or we could just say multiple more. Um, do And it sounds like from George and Darcy and Sarah, I'm hearing that if there are fewer applicants than vacancies, then we want to recruit more. Right. Alyssa. 
and just to make it more complicated in addition to all of those already well expressed concerns there are going to be scenarios where you want to do exactly what the town manager just did although he may have done it for other reasons which is that he didn't fill up the entire community development block grant advisory committee he went ahead and did some appointments and so it may be that we would decide, as Darcy had indicated, that because it, you have to look at this holistically, it may be that we would decide, well, given that they're about to lose quorum or that they have lost quorum, we see these two applicants, one of which is a reappointment and, and again, depending on how we do this publicly, et cetera, but we could refer to them as new and reappointment and not totally give away every detail at this point of the way we've been doing it. And we need to fill some seats. So we're gonna, we're gonna appoint one, or we're gonna appoint two, even if we literally only have two applicants, one of which is a reappointment, because we have to. But then we're going to advertise to get more. So I do think that there is literally no way to come up with anything other than a statement that says, we'll think about all these things. We will consider all the things that everybody just said as being criteria, we'll, we'll just have to come to a point to say, well, it's you know the middle of the month, and this is where we are. What do we do next? Because that will then then and have that discussion and say, oh, we just heard from the town manager that that committee is having trouble meeting quorum. So that will be a different conversation than if we said, you know, everybody is fine. We're just if we're not looking to fill a vacancy, like we're just waiting for June 30th to arrive, and it's only February then we can say, oh, well, we can do a lot more recruiting because we have lots of time. Sarah. So I also would say when we're talking about vacancies, this is something that Alyssa's brought up, is if there's someone there for reappointment, do we consider a reappointment a vacancy or not? And it would be my preference that we would. So say that there were four people who were um, four vacancies, I'm gonna say pure vacancies, um, how I want to say this. So there are four vacancies and two people are, are up for reappointment. I would want to see at least like six people. I mean, I wouldn't want to assume that the reappointments were just considered. Someone who was up for reappointment was automatically. Um, if someone's up for re reappointment, we don't put their spot, that we would put their spot as a vacancy because we're not assuming that they would be reappointed. Does that make, I'm trying to see if that made sense. Right, so the number of vacancies is being determined by, is, is working under the assumption that someone who might be up for reappointment isn't guaranteed a spot, and so. Right. right. So this, this operates perhaps a little bit differently than how the town manager's been operating where reappointment, um, right. George. And I come from this from a different perspective, um, but I'm open to being argued away from it. But at the moment, um, I feel somewhat strongly that there is generally a preference um, for reappointment. That doesn't guarantee anything, but um, it's, it is the way it has been done in the uh, committee handbook, as it's stated. Um, but <clears throat> so I um, would not completely agree with Sarah that that it's just like we're starting over, that <clears throat> the slate is clean. And uh, um, again, I feel that uh, uh, if someone has served competently for their three years or two years or whatever it is, and they're up for reappointment, that there should be a uh, expectation, as it's stated here in the handbook, um, that they would be given preference for a second term especially if we are going to go to term limits or at least to talk about them in any um, specificity. Um, I yeah. would prefer, uh, I would not quite phrase it the way uh, Sarah has. Sure, That's, so th there's two separate things I think going on and part of it is for the next discussion that yeah. we're gonna have and so about how, how much preferential treatment a, a reappointment gets. Sarah's point I think is just if there's, if there's one pure vacancy, someone resigns, and then there's one person whose term is ending, and we wanna say we always wanna make sure that we have more, or we strive to have more applicants than vacancies, then we're looking for a minimum of three applicants because that 
reappointment because the term is ending is still viewed as a vacancy even if there might be preferential, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to saying we want two applicants because that person's probably gonna be reappointed so there's only one real vacancy. So I guess it's all about how we define a vacancy. Do we find a vacancy when mm -hmm. a term is ending? Um, if there's potential for reappointment or do we define a vacancy purely as there's no one who's going to be in that spot? It, sorry, is that? Sorry. I just wanted to make it really clear because I think this has maybe been a point of either contention or uh, misunderstanding is that I'm definitely not saying just because someone is up for um, reappointment that I would automatically, so uh, if someone's up for reappointment, they're up for reappointment and I'm not necessarily saying that that means we should just dismiss them or that they start from square one. Obviously they've served and if they've served mm -hmm. well then that gives them um, that gives them that status. So I'm not I'm I'm not saying that I want people just to start from square one. Okay, sure. How we define vacancy Yeah, I think that's where we're at right now. Okay. Other other thoughts on any of these three discussion items or anything with regard to how we assess sufficiency of the pool? Alyssa. Yeah, I think we had, do have to be really careful about the way we phrase vacancy, not only for the reasons you've just expressed, but also because I've had many arguments with local newspaper reporters when it comes to elected office, where they will sometimes say, there's a vacancy on the school committee. It's like, no, not until you know the election happens. No one's left yet, right? There are seats that are up for re-election. There are seats that are up for appointment or reappointment, but there's no, a vacancy means there's a hole. Uh -huh. And so we've used some phrasing in the past and we used it I, recently to say that, you know, they're, they're, and I think the town manager used some of it in his most recent call for applicants, which is there may be vacancies, right? Because that covers you from the standpoint of when you're expressing it to the public. There may be vacancies. We don't know. We don't know if everybody who's there already is going to reapply and if we're going to have a you automatically get six years kind of uh, rule or not, right? Because we're going to keep arguing about that. But you just make it clear that it's not actually vacant until it's vacant. And if it's not actually yet vacant, then you phrase it as there may be a vacancy because, and then we have to decide amongst ourselves within that what that actually means in terms of the numbers. And, and I, of course, as you would suspect, agree with the idea that reappoint people who are in seats who are technically allowed to be reappointed, mm -hmm. which is literally everyone right now because there is no nuclear thing where you can't appoint people beyond six years. So technically every single person other than Amherst Cultural Council appointments are eligible to be reappointed for ever. Mm -hmm. So when we say it, we just need to be clear what kind of vacancy we're talking about. Are we talking about an upcoming potential vacancy? Or are we talking about we have a hole we need to fill right now, which is why I said I think the conversation's different in terms of how many applicants we have. If we have a hole to fill right now for quorum and we get an amazing applicant, I'm not going to sit there and say I have to wait until a second person applies so that I can feel like I had two people apply for this. I want to jump on that person and say, let's do it. That's obviously a really good solution to, to our quorum problem here. So that's another reason I'm loath to say it has to always be plus one, because we could be sitting here for weeks, or are we just going to have somebody turn in a fake CAF so that we can, so that we can say we got one? I mean, that, that to me does not serve our purposes. But it is true that not having a hard and fast rule means we have to talk about it when the time comes more often than we would if we just said, oh, don't talk to us unless there's X amount in the pool. George. So my observation about CBA and planning and perhaps finance, but certainly CBA and planning is being politically contentious. I'm just curious what uh, Alyssa thinks about that because there I think even if you have the candidate, you know, from heaven, that you know is just fits the bill perfectly. I still have concerns about um, filling a position on those bodies without, uh, with only one uh, candidate, whether it's a whole or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it does seem like our appointments are, at least I feel in the, in our case, are different. At least these two are different than um, the vast majority of appointments that the town manager makes and that we um, approve or recommend um, to the council. 
but do, do you see that or do you feel that, I'm just curious what you make of that, if anything, maybe nothing. Melissa? So I'm gonna say that the only reason that people don't accurately perceive that the town manager is appointing things that are just as political is because they're unaware of the power that things like the Board of Health and the Historical Commission have. The Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning Board in some rubric of you know measurement of how many power gavels they have or whatever mm -hmm. are not significantly ahead of mm -hmm. Historical Commission, Board mm -hmm. of Health, Conservation Commission. It just feels that way because of the press that is available to that and the fact that if you're not upset about something Historical Commission's done recently, but you're probably upset about something Planning Board's done recently mm -hmm. and it's just kind of human nature. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I understand what you're saying. We obviously have to have, no matter what kind of process we end up with, which we know, I think at this point, isn't gonna be the same as the one we have had, which made many people unhappy, but at least was very clear on what it was, mm -hmm. um, that we just need to make sure we keep doing that. We need to have something to be clear on what it was. But I will, I, I can't agree that because it's a heavily political nature, I mean, which it is, I agree, that oh well, even though we have an amazing applicant, we really can't move on because I need to check off a box that says I have an extra person because that's not how the real world works. Um, that's not how job hiring works. That's just not how anything works. And so I think we need to do more outreach all the time, right? And I think that it's up to this committee, assuming it's still our charge next year, to say, to have us say, we have one, it's amazing and then everybody else go, but that's not enough. And then have a vote, okay, it's not enough. And then we don't go further. That's why we discuss it here. And then even if we all say, man, that person's amazing, we're gonna have a five to zero vote, amazingly enough. And we're gonna go to town council and say, there was only one applicant for this, up, for this actual vacancy, aren't they amazing? And if town council says, yeah, they are, but you know, I'd really like to go through the exercise of having the box checked off and they can wait a couple more weeks because we want to interview more people, then that's the town council's decision. So I mean, we're making those decisions in public rather than what I feel like we're doing if we set up specific numbers, we're actually making those decisions not publicly because we're saying it has to sit someplace before we can act on it. Whereas I'm saying, let's keep reevaluating throughout the process. I mean, luckily we're not doing this for 40 committees anymore. Right. We're doing this for three. We ought to be able to keep track of where we are on any of those individual things. And I can't justify leaving a vacancy someplace if we've got amazing people to fill it just in hopes that somebody else is going gonna, is gonna to apply. Darcy. Um, I, uh, I guess I agree with uh, George on this that, that um, because some of these appointments are going to be politically contentious that it would make sense for us to to if we have um, the number of like an equal number of CAFs to the vacancies um, that it makes sense to do another round you know it wouldn't take that much time to just do another round to to make an attempt to to get more applicants, a more diverse pool of applicants, and um, at least one additional round, if not more than one additional round, to try, because for our th three committees, they're so important, and we, we need, and we're responsible for them, apparently. Um, it seems like that's our responsibility to try to get a diverse pool. The other thing that I, um, would note is that it shouldn't really be the number of CAFs. It should be the number of CAFs that um, that represent appropriately p people who have applied with a, with the appropriate skills and expertise. Because as we all know, we get a lot of CAFs that um, aren't don't represent the adequate skills and e expertise and which shouldn't really be counted. George, do you have something to say? I, I don't know how you, I, yeah. 
it sounds like that's something that the uh, whatever process we finally agree upon uh, is settled through that process. We look at the CAS and we say, oh, no, 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 yep, yep, nope. But I don't see how we could put it into any kind of uh, rule or, or, or statement by the committee that the number of uh, applicants, somehow their CAFs have to meet a certain standard. Um, it's just, my concern is perception. Politics is perception. And I think it's important that, um, that people see that um, this process, and we will do this, I know, but it will be transparent and open and that um, we are looking at multiple candidates for these positions, not just um, one person. And, and I would be very uncomfortable, no matter how good or how much of an emergency, I mean, I'm also trying to imagine an emergency that would be such that you'd have to appoint somebody right away um, or the ZBA couldn't function. The ZBA has associates, planning board has, uh, right, a large, so I, I, I'm just concerned about perception and I'm also concerned about the sense, given the nature of these appointments, that um, we bend over backwards to make sure that, that uh, there's truly a, a, a pool and it isn't just you know, perceived as a done deal. Other comments? Okay, so there seems to be two very different opinions here, and I want to try something. Mm -hmm. And this is not an actual vote, this is a straw vote, but I just want to read off two separate conflicting statements and ask for you to raise your hand if you agree with that statement. Read them both. I will read them both first, and then I will ask how many agree, agree with statement one and two. Because at some point, we have to bring forward something that this committee has at least majority agreement on. So the two statements are, one, we should always make sure that we have more CAS than vacancies, and if not, do more recruiting to move forward. And number two is, if there's a vacancy to fill, we should move forward if there are good candidates who applied regardless of whether there are fewer applicants than vacancies. I recognize there are gray areas in between. Mm -hmm. These are the two opposite sides. So can I ask how many people agree with number one? And number two, okay. That's useful. Sort of useful. <laughs> it's useful, not um, complicated, but useful. Okay. Um, I do want to take a look at the third question, which is we've been talking about number. I think Darcy brought up a really good but hard to assess point of it's not just the number. Of, if you have someone who submits a CAF who is like clearly has no qualifications and probably checked the wrong box, uh, do you count that? So it's really not about number, you're saying, but people who actually we would consider appointing. Um, but we've been talking a lot about number, um, but of course this is obviously a council um, that cares a lot about um, diversity. There's been discussion of demographics uh, and how we present demographic information, how we report it. Um, so the question is, we've been talking about number. When we're looking at an applicant pool, do we also want to consider diversity and demographics? So let's say that there are two vacancies and we get seven applicants, but they're all men. We may have met some number that we all feel comfortable with, but maybe perhaps not a diversity of applicants that we feel comfortable with. Should we even take diversity and demographics into consideration when deciding whether or not to move forward? And if so, how would we even go about doing that? Obviously, I don't imagine we'd have hard and fast rules, but is this something we even want to consider? Thoughts? Darcy. Yes. Um, uh, I, that's one of the reasons why I think we should just, if, if we don't have adequate diversity and demographics, just do another round of outreach, at least one additional round. Um, is my opinion because I don't see how we could say that we're really trying if we don't do that. What? Sarah, 
Take him behind George. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the things that someone who's very intelligent, I think, said to me when we first started considering this process was that um, if someone is a minority in this society, um, it may be that they need some support and encouragement in applying. I would think that um, if you're in a minority, th this one I, I think, you know, I guess women, right? Um, this is the one that I can at least relate to and say that I, I can think that one through, um, is that you may assume that you might as well not apply because you know that most likely some of the usual suspects or um, people who are assuming who they would get that position would be of a certain subset of our society and so you wouldn't even try. So I think that although if you ask me right now how in the world, Sarah, are you going to do that outreach, I would say I don't know. But I think that there is, um, I, I would want to try to do some outreach to at least uh, make people who are in, in any minority feel supported that they, they could come forward and have a shot. Alyssa. Thank you for saying it that way, Sarah. Because um, building off of that, one of, the, one of the things I was starting to clang with was when I kept hearing over and over, we can do an additional round. All the only outreach we formally have right now, we're talking about formal numbers and when to decide. The literal only outreach that we have formalized right now is putting an announcement on the website. Why would putting an announcement on a website two weeks from now give us any better of a yield than putting it on today? Now, if we put it on during the religious holidays in December, obviously that's a bad time and July is a bad time. But beyond that, website announcements are not another round of outreach. I mean, yeah, it's the only thing we can check off the box. We need to figure out what would outreach look like. If we sit here and say, this pool is not sufficient, we don't just put up another website announcement. That's useless. What we do is we have to figure out a way to go find people, of course, which really means we have to have found them already so we don't have to be in that position. But that's where right, our outreach and our interface with the CPOs and the RAC matters so much because we know that website announcements, as opposed to you saw somebody at the block party and you said, have you ever considered being on such and such since you're complaining about such and such? <laughs> and that actually works way better than a website announcement that they may or may not be subscribed to. And that is for the usual privileged people who feel like they can complain, much less for people who are much less familiar with the standard operation of town government, which is why we've been including a phrase along those lines in our vacancy notices that we're looking for people who haven't necessarily been previously engaged. And building off of that, my other initial comment had been that when we have to be really careful when we talk about the skills, and I know there's the statement in the charter because the charter has many questionable, in my opinion, things in it, but it talks about this whatever phrase associated with the type of applicant you should have. But if I sit down with somebody for, I don't know, 15 minutes, random person off the street, I can find a way for them to express why their skills and experiences will reasonably qualify them for any committee experience in this town. I can do that for them. They can't necessarily do that for themselves because they don't know what's out there and what's interesting. And I'm utterly appalled by the idea that we would sit here looking at our useless CAF that's currently not helpful at all in obtaining that information to be able to say, oh, we don't, this CAF is not qualified, but this CAF is. The, literally the only place I find that to be true is with Water Supply Protection Committee where we need these really technical skills from people. And I'm not going to put on somebody who's just like really curious and interested and good at organizing. That's not a good fit for them. I'm going to find another fit for them. But I can find a fit for anybody on any committee that would work for them. And so to dismiss some CAFs as not being appropriate unless, as Evan pointed out, occasionally people do make clerical errors and just apply for the wrong thing is not fair. I mean, we put people on shade tree all the time who don't know anything about trees other than the fact that they grow. And that's 
fun because they're great shade tree members. And so we've had wonderful success on that. So I am not at all up for saying we toss out some CAFs early in the process and they don't count toward whatever number we have in our minds because we know the CAF itself is a, process, is a problem and no matter how we change it, people still aren't gonna be able to express their full story in a CAF. George. I think clearly this uh, committee takes seriously diversity and demographics and will always be considering it um, when we make our recommendations. Uh, I don't get a sense that anyone here doesn't see that as important. Um, but I, I do, we also have an obligation to fill these bodies. These are three, uh, two, I would say three extremely important bodies in the town. Um, uh, with all due respect to the, the Shade Committee and to any number of other committees out there that, that do good work, um, the ZBA, the Planning Board, and the Finance Committee um, are not just any old committees. Um, and so I think we also have to balance our obligation to fill those bodies. And I would be very uncomfortable personally with um, saying we're going to do another round for these bodies because we're not satisfied with the diversity and demographics. Um, we are concerned about diversity and demographics and it's something that we're gonna be struggling with I think for all the time that at least we're serving on this body. Um, but to say, okay, we're not happy, you know, we've got enough applicants. It's, it's more, the pool is big enough but we're not happy with the demographics. And the question immediately arises, well, what is it about the demographics you don't like? Is it race, is it gender, is it renters, is it, right? There are any number of possibilities. And um, uh, so um, I think we have to balance these two things. And I'm very uncomfortable, I would be uncomfortable with a situation where we say, nope, we're not going to make any um, recommendations for this body right now, even though the pool is, is you know, large enough because we don't feel it is demographically uh, or diverse enough. Um, which then raises the question, then when we do make our, our recommendations, um, doesn't that suggest that we're then going to be uh, uh, appointing someone who does fit our demographic or diverse picture? And if we don't, people will scratch their heads and say, well, um, wh why did they even do this at all? So I wanna say that yes, we take this seriously. It's gonna be a long-term process. I'm not comfortable with using the actual appointment process with a way to, uh, to force this issue. I think it has to be addressed uh, in other ways. Other thoughts on diversity? Uh, Sarah. So I think that I understand the pure way in which George is approaching this and in, in which we're saying if you know, we desperately need someone for you know, quorum, on these committees that some of them are, you know, specialized that if we have a CAF or if we quote unquote know someone, then we should just go ahead and fill that vacancy with someone that is, that uh, people on this council or on this committee feel is a known quantity. I see that from the, the practical standpoint that I think that George is, is bringing that forward. Um, I would say to that, that for me that speaks of a very real personal need for outreach, as Alyssa said, for actually seeing people and talking to people and knowing people and encouraging people because I will tell you as someone who Running for town council, I was a woman who only has a four-year college degree <laughs> and not a ton of experience, and I needed someone to tell me, hey, I think you could do this, otherwise I would not have put my name in the hat, and I think that similarly, especially for boards that we see as planning and, and zoning boards, which are so politically charged and seen as so powerful, there may be people out there who have the qualifications, but they need to know that someone stands beside them or gives them a shot, and it's not just going, they don't even need to apply because it's just gonna be that, that town council decides to automatically grab a known quantity. So I'm not sure, I don't, I can't tell you right now, you know, obviously it's just not another round of, of applications, but it, 
when we think about where we stand on outreach for our appointments later, I think that's a, something to really think about. Darcy. Just to clarify, when I said that uh, I think that, we, that if the, the pool isn't adequately diverse, that we should have an additional round, um, mm -hmm. I didn't mean just the uh, advertisement on the town website. It would just give additional time. We would then be aware that the pool was all white men and that what, what we would be looking for. So it would just give some a extra time to do whatever w outreach with the CPOs, with the website, with us knowing and being able to reach out for an additional X amount of time. And then if we couldn't find anyone, then go forward with the pool that we have. Um, it just is a way of um, showing that we're serious about really trying to get more diversity. So I want to add my mm -hmm. two cents in here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I sort of agree a little bit with everyone, even though you all are disagreeing with each other. Um, <laughs> in that I think obviously if there's some type of emergency in a situation like uh, Alyssa made clear where they're about to lose quorum, especially for a body as important as um, planning board, which doesn't at present have associate members, right. um, then I think all of, uh, you know, a, any desire to have enough applicants, a certain number of applicants or a certain level of diversity would probably be suspended. Um, I think if we wait until the very last minute to start, rec to start recruiting people, um, then that presents a problem. But assuming that we recognize there will be vacancies uh, at, in June, if we start and we have a process in place so we don't use our entire winter coming up with a process, um, then we can start recruiting something long-term. And I think that um, what Sarah said is actually really important. So let me actually back up. I think that when it comes to diversity, I, I agree with things that were said about having a holistic approach to things. I think we need to look at what the pool looks like. We don't, I don't want any type of arbitrary, we need to make sure it's at least 40% women or you know 30% people of color. I think those 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 will only serve to to hamper us. But I think we do want to look and say, is this a diverse pool by several factors? Like George mentioned, it's not just race or gender, uh, socioeconomics, um, and hopefully we have a CAF that can better collect that information for us. I think it's also relative to the size of the pool. If we have three candidates and we decide that there's one vacancy and three candidates and that's enough, it's hard to impose some diversity requirements on a very small pool. But if we get, you know, 20 candidates for ZBA in the magical world, um, and they're 100% white men, I would actually probably be more likely to not move forward in that case, because I'd say, well, hold on, what's going on here? Why are we having so many people interested in the ZBA, and it's only a single demographic? I, so I personally think that diversity demographics should be considered. I don't think that there should be any hard criteria, but I think it should be a consideration. But I think that we can't say that we're going to consider it without pairing it with an outreach strategy to actually reach out to these communities. And I think part of that's on the CPO, but I think part of that's on us. So I don't want to say we're going to look at the demographics and diversity of a pool before moving forward until we've also had a discussion on outreach about how we're going to work to make our applicant pool more diverse because then we're saying we're going to put in a potential barrier without ever putting in a way for us to move past it. So I think the outreach needs to be paired with this. I think they can't be separate. Um, I don't want to ever necessarily, I don't want to stop a pool if we, I don't want to ever stop us from moving forward if we've tried and we don't get what we want, but I do think it needs to be considered, and I do think in a situation where we have a large pool that seems to have the only one demographic, then we want to turn to the people who are doing outreach and say, whatever, whatever's being done, something, try something new, right? Um, that's, that's where I'm at. So with both numbers and diversity, I don't want hard criteria, but I do want these things considered sort of as guidelines so that we can look at the whole pool holistically and say, do we have enough of what we're looking for to move forward, or do we need to turn to our outreach folks and say, hey, we need to do more recruiting, and it can't look, 
you know, much like Alyssa said, that doesn't just mean another post on the website. That means thinking about outreach and recruiting in different ways. Um, Alyssa. That was extremely well stated with all parts, and I, I just want to make sure I push back just directly enough on the idea of a number of applicants. Holist I know it's easy, because I love checklists myself, and I don't think we use enough of them, but they're also important not to misuse. And so that's why I was so loath to say, oh, well, if you know, the, the answer is plus one, or the answer is plus two, or the answer is plus three in terms of perceived vacancies, and you know, whether you count reappointments in there or not obviously affects that math. But I heard at least one person say, well, we might have the right number, but it might turn out that it's not demographically. We don't have the right number then if we don't have the demographics. There is no such thing in my mind as having an adequate number of applicants if there isn't some diversity associated with that. And then you may end up having to write a report that says we tried 15 different things and we still only got X in terms of diversity and we still only got X in terms of numbers. But I would never ever want us moving forward to say we got enough, it's too bad it wasn't sufficiently diverse because it wasn't enough if it wasn't sufficiently diverse. George. Hmm. It looked like you were gonna say something. What about age? In other words, I sometimes look at the pool and think, where are the college students that make up more than half the population of Amherst? Um, so uh, I hear Alyssa, I think, um, but it, it just, when we start saying that this pool is not demographically um, diverse, I guess we're going to have to agree on what the uh, categories are, um, because I could say that just about every pool that I've ever seen is demographically not diverse, because it rarely, if ever, includes someone under the age of 24 in a town where over half the population is, is, is that age, thereabouts. Um, and outreach there is extremely difficult for any number of reasons. That doesn't mean that some of us don't try, um, but uh, so um, I, I would say the demographic information we're seeking to collect on the CIF would be the demographic information that we'd say we'd consider. But I think the point of not having criteria, right, is not to say for each of these demographic categories we need some representation, which is why I think having sort of a, a broader view of the pool is important. Because I agree with you, age is often it's ignored. Ignored. It's just ignored. But we do ask it on the CAF. Uh, Alyssa. So, so we're talking about both hypotheticals and practicals here, George, <clears throat> specifically, is we absolutely could say that every pool we've ever had is insufficiently diverse for people of color and for, with maybe one exception, um, and certainly for age. That doesn't mean that just because we can argue that, we should argue that. It means we should be taking it into account. And that's why we as a group have to justify that, right? And so rather than saying we have a checklist that says we have three upcoming vacancies, we have four CAFs, they, they appear to be this charter qualified for that, oh, we did our job. I'm saying our job is more complex as we have already treated it. We're not doing anything wrong now. We just wanna continue in the good work that we're doing now that is unfortunately not easy to quantify numbers wise. And we should absolutely be looking at every single pool and saying, we got this number, not an adequate number, but we got this number, we got this many of this age, we got this many that identified as other than white, we got this socioeconomic. Given the balance, given this committee, as you said, George, given the skills that are in fact somewhat, you know, strongly related to planning board and ZBA, mm -hmm. you know, given all those factors put together, 
are you going to be the opinion that always on, is on the end of the 4-1 vote that says, yeah, but it's not a college student. I mean, how does that solve anything, right? But, but that means that we keep asking that question, right? Can we find a role? And maybe we can't on our committees, or maybe we can on fi the finance committee, for example, but maybe we can't so much on planning board and ZBA, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. And so that should always be a question, age, socioeconomic status, all those things, just like the number, but the number does not go plus that. The number is just one of the many factors. That's okay, so I want to move on in our agenda. Um, I think I think I'm. I think I'm hearing, and again, we're not taking any votes on any of this today, but I think I'm hearing at least majority agreement that diversity demographics is is a consideration in reviewing the pool and, and determining sufficiency of the pool to move forward. What that looks like, of course, is uh, more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's for later. Um, what I want to turn on to right now is uh, agenda item 4B, uh, which is what creates a healthy multiple member body. So um, in theory, this is something we're going to return to a little bit later as well after we talk about how we do interviews, when we talk about how we recommend appointments. But because it's been um, such a large discussion topic in this committee and also in the council, I wanted to have at least two discussions of it um, separated by some time. Uh, and so after we have applicants and we're thinking about either, I, and I think we would think about this right before and after interviews, which is what are we looking for in candidates who we might appoint? Um, and a lot of that has to do with the individual candidate, but a lot of that has to do with the body itself. And so um, we want to think about not just the skills and qualifications that an applicant brings to the table or perspectives or experiences, but also what does the body need? What applicant, it's not always about which applicant has the most technical expertise or qualifications. It's oftentimes which applicant fits best with what the committee needs to function well in that moment in time. Um, and so I want to have a conversation about what creates a healthy multiple member body. Uh, there are two documents in the packet that are related to this. One was written by Sarah. It is uh, when she was selecting ZBA and planning board. She wrote up uh, some criteria for what makes a healthy multiple member body that she used to select her candidates for planning board and ZBA. Uh, we all read that. We never actually had a real committee discussion about whether we agreed with it because um, we didn't need to in that moment. I mean, this was the, this was the OCA designee's criteria that she used to select. Um, but I think it would be useful for us to have some agreement over that. Um, and then the second one is the appointed committee handbook. And I particularly pulled out uh, sections 2.3 and 2.5 um, because those are the ones that talk about appointment and they also talk about term limits, which I think is an important part of this discussion and one we've kept saying We'll talk about term limits later. We'll talk about term limits later. We'll talk about term limits later. Uh, so later is now. Yep. So um, you lost your internet. Oh, indeed. Um, so why don't we, we can have both of these up, but I want to look at what Sarah drafted, because I think that that puts us in a really good position to have this conversation. And so Sarah put forth. Uh, three different criteria for what creates a healthy and monthly member body. One is a strong chair with term limits. A Two is a strong base of seasoned members. And three is new members. And I want to have sort of a fairly open, we're not voting on anything, a fairly open conversation about what we think uh, makes for a healthy multiple member body. And this, again, is a conversation that can include a discussion of whether we want to have term limits um, and that will inform how we look at candidates. So, thoughts? This is a little bit bigger topic than the one we talked about before, which is why we're going to return to it later again. Mm -hmm. so. Sarah. Oh, oh. I, I was just going to say, I, I already wrote mine down and did my homework. <laughs> Other thoughts? Do we want to start with something specific to talk about? Okay, term limits. So 
Let's start there, because that might be the hardest one. Term limits, not term limits generally. Yeah. So um, Sarah's just talked about term limits for the chair, I believe. But I don't have it right in front of me right now. Um, but our uh, appointed committee handbook, um, which since we have not as a town council adopted one or revised it, we are still operating under uh, 2.3, does have uh, the statement in here that I'm losing right now. Um, George, what are you going to say? Because now I'm, I've lost my place. We don't appoint or right uh, or recommend or whatever chairs, right? We simply uh, approve or recommend appointments. So it's up to the body to select their chair. Um, so I don't disagree with this statement at all. I think it's perfectly sensible. But um, it's not our job to choose the chairs of these bodies. Um, we simply um, uh, make appointments, or in our case, we recommend to the council that they make appointments, but we don't, make rec we don't recommend to the council that they appoint somebody as chair of a zoning board or plan. Is that, that's, Alyssa? Alyssa. A hundred percent correct, I, but I do think that what this nicely feeds into is the future revision of the appointed committee handbook. This is something, if we did decide as a group, we all agreed with, which, Chances are we might agree with, given that we didn't give any pushback back when it was written the first time. But um, this could be another thing in the appointed committee handbook that, because that serves as guidance beyond the point of the appointed committee handbook is not to repeat stuff that's an open meeting law or ethics. It's like that's already out there. You're stuck having to do that stuff. The point of the appointed committee handbook is to give people a sense of what Amherst style is of, a point of doing things. And so just like there's this really long section on appointment here, there could also be a section in the chair section, for example. I mean, we could orient it anyway, but we, we don't have to say anything about it, but we already have this written, and we're certainly thinking about it as we're thinking about terms in general. I mean, I think it is generally applicable, even though she wrote it as for chairs, but we could also, if we wanted to, have separate guidance on chairs. We just would do it within that document, not within, like, selling our next appointments. By the way, out of the five appointments we're recommending, you should pick this one as chair. George. And again, I bring our attention back to the fact that we're talking about three specific bodies. Yes. And these, at least two of these three bodies, at least in my conversations with people who have served, are serving, on these bodies, um, that um, there are a number of uh, years needed simply to get up to speed. Um, and um, this has been repeated to me by a number of people from different um, bodies about these two bodies, about CBA and planning. Um, and um, so if you're talking about term limits for a chair and somebody served for three years on a body and the, 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 the body feels that they've acquired sufficient uh, experience and, and uh, with this particular body that they would make an excellent chair, are you then saying that, well, they only get three years and then they're out? Um, I do have um, some reservations about the application of term limits to planning board and CBA. Um, I don't um, except I, I understand what uh, that it makes sense in, in many other contexts, and perhaps this group will agree it makes sense in these two contexts as well, but I don't agree. Um, given the nature of what these bodies do and given some of the conversations I've had with people who have or are serving on these bodies, there is a very steep learning curve. And um, you don't just walk in in a year or two and you're ready to chair the ZBA or chair the planning board. And so if we have a strict six-year limit on service on these bodies, which we may decide to do, or at least keep that, um, you're saying that a chair maximum could probably serve for three years. So I, wanna, I want to talk not, I, about term limits more broadly, 
and not just about chairs. I think that Alyssa's right that that's something that could go into the appointed committee handbook. And should we all continue serving on OCA past January and should I remain as chair? Uh, one of the things I imagined we would do in the near future was take a look at that appointed committee handbook for update now that we're under a new form of government. That's not what we're doing right now. Um, but however, we do have to think about our OCA policy, which is separate, of how we would recommend candidates. And so I pulled from the appointed committee handbook uh, the two statements that I think are relevant to the conversation and what I would like us to do. I'm going to read those two statements and I would like us to have a conversation about those two, whether we agree with them, whether we don't, whether we want to change them. Um, and that will be written into our OCA policy. So they are from 2.3. Generally, if a person is serving a first term, they are given preference for a second. Conversely, if a person is completing a second term and there are other qualified applicants, preference would be given to a newcomer. And from 2.5, although there is no fixed limit on length of service, the length of service is normally limited to two terms, three years in length. In cases where special training or expertise is required, longer periods of service may be appropriate. So there's really two things within that. One is um, prefer preferential treatment for candidates up for reappointment. And the second is, although not a fixed limit on number of terms, uh, a, a preference for two terms with an understanding of longer periods uh, when there's special training. So what I'd like us to focus on right now is those two statements, agreement, disagreement, whether we want to continue that as our policy as OCA, whether we hate that and want to do something different. The appointed committee handbook. Yeah, the link's in our packet. So, thoughts on those two statements? Agree, disagree, want to change, want to just make our lives easier and say that's going to be our policy? What do we think? <laughs> George. George. Maybe someone else should speak first, but I've... Well, I no one else raised their hands. So. All right, fine, I raised my hand. Um, I feel strongly that, again, we're talking about three specific bodies, in particular two, and I do have very grave reservations about this as a policy for ZBA and planning for it. And I would encourage the members of this committee to actually, and maybe we can do it as a, a group, speak to um, not only people who are serving or have served on these bodies and get their input, but also perhaps ask people from the planning department um, to come and speak about uh, this or at least seek out their, their advice. Because again, I'm just speaking for myself but unlike many, I, I think this is, uh, generally speaking, an excellent idea for um, many, many of our committees, and I think it's healthy and appropriate, and I support it 100%, but I do have serious reservations about applying this to ZBA and Planning Board, um, and I would at least ask us to um, have a conversation, either individually or collectively, with um, Planning Department, um, staff and or Brestrup, Christine Brestrup, um, to get some input, if they can give it, um, about the learning curve and about what it's actually like to serve on these bodies, because as I've said, and, I'm, and I'll shut up, um, uh, I've been told by a number of people that this, that the learning curve is very steep, and they really value um, people who have been able to stay on these bodies for a number of years. Um, just given expertise and knowledge. Um, I know those words sometimes get people's uh, hackles up, but anyway, so that's my, I have reservations about this strongly with these two bodies of CBA and Planning Board. Alyssa. So my, my hackles aren't up on this, George, <laughs> but I will say at the risk of offending many friends who have served on Planning Board and ZBA and in the Planning Department over the years, Part of the reason it's so complicated to be on planning board and ZBA is because they are not given adequate training. And so while the practical reality is it takes a really long time to get up to speed, the practical reality is also they do not consistently get adequate training and framing of issues, et cetera, et cetera, much as we've talked about at town council mm -hmm. in terms of how is it that we know what we're doing. And that's traditionally been a problem with Planning Board and CBA as well because there are only so many hours in the day. And no matter how competent staff is, depending on how much time you're willing to spend as a town 
to train people to do things. You might remember, for example, that Board of Assessors, they're required to go off to a certain training, the state level. They're actually not required to do that for Planning Board or ZBA. There are citizen planning seminars, but again, then you have to have volunteers as opposed to employees who are normally on the clock anyway. You have to have volunteers find time in their schedule to go to those training things, and only some people that are serving have the ability to do that. So how do you get that information back to here? So that is both the theoretical and the realistic of how it should be, but I also understand that practically speaking, it's not really how it is. Um, I will say that even when we did have people serving for 10 years on planning board, we still didn't have a seat at Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, so that didn't solve the problem. Just having people there for a certain length of time was not sufficient to get us a seat on that particular body um, in terms of the executive board. I have talked to these people repeatedly because I used to be associated with them for various reasons, associated with the master plan and also the select board used to appoint CBA. And I feel very strongly that exactly what it says right now, in cases where special training or expertise is required, longer periods of service may be appropriate. I feel that exactly covers your concern. And it's exactly why we reappointed somebody to the ZBA who'd been there a long time for exactly those reasons. And so it's really important to me, and we can, you know, wordsmith, obviously, but it's really important to me when it says the part about the six years, and I'm even you know, a little loath to be as heavy on as the way the handbook is now, on, yeah, you'll probably get offered a second term, because our point is not to keep people in office. Our point is to have a healthy functioning committee. On the other hand, sort of like a tenure conversation, which is so important in the Amherst area, is we don't want to throw people off for, you know, because we don't like the way they think. Right, so, so that's an important protection for people too, as long as they're actually doing the work, right? We don't wanna ditch them just because they're the ones that are always asking too many questions at meetings, right? Like that's not a, a reason to dump somebody. So that's a good reason to mention, yeah, you'll probably get offered a second term. But if you're just gonna automatically just give everybody a second term, then just say terms are six years long and be done with it or admit to people we're not actually advertising for vacancies because we're just gonna reappoint all these people that say they wanna stay on and we aren't even gonna interview them because I'm sure they're great or we would've heard about it. So I, re I feel like, of course, because I used to be responsible for this document, I feel like it pretty well walks that line between you know academic freedom, so to speak, being able to speak your mind on the committee, respecting your commitment to it, not requiring that you continue on because some people don't even want to make a three-year commitment to things and also saying we always have the out of special training or expertise which entirely explains well that and lack of recruitment both explain why we had some planning board members who have served for nine or ten years on a regular basis over the whole time I've lived here Darcy so have those planning board members served that long because there were no new applicants? Question for Alyssa. Go ahead, Alyssa. In my experience, the planning board applicants serve for that long partly because of the special training or expertise is required, right? Because they became very conversant. They did go to trainings. They participated fully in meetings. They sucked up all the knowledge that's in that's available and were incredibly useful members of the planning board and maybe other people had left, right? And so it was even more important to have somebody with a long history of experience because there was turnover in the, other, in the rest of the membership to a point, um, remembering that it was really hard to keep nine seats filled on a regular basis mm -hmm. on the planning board. Mm -hmm. And so that was another reason to keep them because it, once you got somebody in and they agreed to it, then you could keep them and that was great. But the other part of it is clearly lack of recruitment because up until 2011, we weren't even interviewing planning board applicants. People would turn in a CAF, town manager looks at the CAF and go, yep, no, yep, and send it on to the select board. Maybe a phone call, maybe not. There was no interview process. Um, I'm not saying people were never interviewed, but there was no process associated with that. And so 
outreach, although we've gone through fits and starts over the years, was not a regular thing. We're paying much more consistent attention to it now. And so, yes, it was for a variety of reasons. One, because we used that phrase. Two, because there weren't a lot of other choices. And three, because it wasn't a big push to outreach for new planning board and ZBA members. And I think people had good intentions of wanting to do that, but nobody ever figured out how to do it. And now we get to try and figure out how to do it. Darcy? Where is that sentence about the uh, can stay on indefinitely if? 2.5. It's 2.5. 2.5 reappointment. Sarah? So originally when I looked at my document again and I thought, oh, the only place I put term limits was when I was talking about chair, is that I think that when we start to have these discussions about what an ultimate you know, term limit should be, is that what you're constantly, what I'm going to say is, I, so I think of a, um, something that wouldn't be a functional um, multi-member body, I think of like a stagnant pool. So nothing's moving, the same four frogs are there, there's, there's no room to increase, you know, people, frogs stopped having babies because there wasn't enough room and the, right? So I mean, it's stagnant, it's, it's not moving and there's not a place for movement or growth. So I guess when I was thinking about the, the naturally how a committee turns over and also has fresh ideas and sort of um, moves with um, the progression of ideas and of certain time periods, you want to have institutional knowledge. I mean, I think that certainly on the council, a lot of us think, holy cow, once I've made it through these first three years, I've known so much about what's going on that I, you know, you can't have me leave yet because we're, we're still really just starting this. Um, if, you want, if you want things to stay healthy and balanced, then you always have someone or a couple people at the sort of the, the top that are, have been there for a long time, they know the ropes, they kind of know the things that you can't just study on paper, you have to be there to know. Um, and then you can impart that knowledge upon younger members. And I think that one of the things that we've all seen just starting here on, on uh, town council is that a chair is very important and a chair definitely makes a committee either be effective or not effective. And the other thing is, is that if you lose a chair that's really good, everybody who's sitting here, I think should always have a mind on being chair and, and what that takes. Because if you lose a chair, right, you need someone who's gonna move into that. I mean, I think I wrote all of us down, right? right? But, and then you have solid members who have been there before, but I think what happens is, is that if you, if, if the perception in the larger community is that we have five people that are, are amazing and have been amazing, they're gonna stay there maybe until the day they die. And if the chair has been there, the chair is great, there's absolutely no way you're going to have that chair move because they're fabulous, we all agree, they're there, they're an institution. What that does to the community in the whole is that people who could be great and amazing and who could learn, they don't want to apply because they know if they get onto a committee, most likely because they're not a, a, a known quantity, they won't even get up to the middle part of the pack, never mind the front, right? And I think that term limits are there to keep the pond moving and to keep it fresh. So I agree with what the handbook says. I think that all of us, when we keep in mind the healthy body, needs to keep in mind that if you aren't at some point turning things over, then you are then just naturally killing off the people feeling like they could come in and that they could, could, see, they could succeed. So, because we're running a little short on time, I want to try again. I'm, I'm trying to, there's some, di clearly we don't have consensus, but I do, at, at some point, we need to have at least majority mm -hmm. in support of some policy, and I want to get a sense of where people are right now, so I'm going to do the same thing again where I'm going to read a statement and ask which one you agree with. Again, this is not an actual vote, so don't worry about that, and it's fine if you change this, because we're going to return to this very same thing um, 
in November, but I wanted to have a conversation that bookended interviews because I think that we would consider this both when we're looking at CAFs before we schedule interviews and as we're thinking about the sufficiency of the pool, and I think we'll also be considering this after we select candidates. So I'm gonna read three statements on reappointment, and then I'll ask you if you agree with one, two, or three, okay? Three? Three statements. Mm -hmm. I can repeat them if needed. So number one, a person who served their first term and did their job well will get reappointment. Two, generally, if a person is serving a first term, they are given preference for a second. Mm -hmm. And three, there is no preferential treatment for reappointment for someone who served their first term. So the difference is one is guaranteed reappointment, two is preferential treatment for reappointments, and three is no preferential treatment for reappointments. So can you raise your hand if you agree with one, guaranteed reappointment? Two, preferential treatment for reappointment. And three, no preferential treatment for reappointment. Okay, now I'm gonna read two statements on term limits. One, a person service on a committee ends after the completion of their second term, so that's hard term limits. Two, if a person is completing a second term and there are other qualified applicants, preference would be given to a newcomer. So one is hard term limits, two is soft term limits with preference for newcomers. Does that make sense? And there's no three? There's no three for this one. And I can't vote. What was your third B, George? Uh, that that, that, that term, there are no term limits, or that term limits are, it's really- So no preference. In cases where special training or expertise is required- That's, we're, we're not there yet. Oh. Let's do, so okay. which one of these do you agree with more then? I understanding oh, okay. Sorry. nothing is black and white, but I have to eventually put some words on paper. So one is hard term limits, two is after two terms, preference for newcomers, but it's not a hard limit. So who agrees with number one? That would be one. Hard limits. Would be so hard. yeah, so that would be one. So one is a person service on the committee ends, no question, after two terms, they're and this, they're out. And the second one is actually the language from the appointed committee handbook. No, they would only be out in number one if. No, it says a person service on a committee ends after the completion of their second term. Right. So that's a hard term limit, two terms and you're out, no matter what else happens. The second one is preference for two terms, preference for a newcomer if someone's served two terms, but it's not a definite hard limit. But is it a definite appointment of the newcomer? That, that's irrelevant here, because it's a term limit to an incumbent. This has nothing to do with newcomers. So. First choice that you've offered us, he's making it hard for us, Nancy. The first choice that you've offered us says it doesn't matter who the other applicants are. Correct. Even if there's no one else on the planet who wants to do this, right. you're, you're done. Uh, you're done. Hard term the limit, two terms, one, there's a vacancy. You're making this very concrete. The second, which is fine. The second one is that you're saying you might, after, after two, th terms. two terms, ter two terms, you in theory, could still get reappointed because of the expertise statement, but our preference is going to be for newcomers. Right. Or, or, or are or, you saying after one term? Because I'm, no, I'm no. confused. No, no, This is a second term. It says if a person completing a second term. Okay, well, so term limits, after. if term limits is only about two terms, then that means everybody gets six years. I mean, your second, you need, you can't have a second option that says, the soft with preference, that, because that's not the same as the appointed committee handbook choice. The appointed committee handbook choice is after your first term, newcomers will be given a preference to your sec, to you getting a second no, term. No, this is, this language is cut You're and saying, pasted from the appointed committee handbook. Uh, if a person, um, Right. So. It has nothing to do with one term. This is only about right. after two term limit, which we're assuming is six years. So we're not right. I'm not putting years down. It's so number of terms. Kind of but okay. Um, you're talking about only the six year term. 
-hmm. I'm talking about after, if you've already been reappointed, you have a, you're finishing a second term, are you definitely out no matter what? Or is there a possibility for continued service, but a preference for a new person? Those are the two choices. I know there's gray areas, but I'm trying to simplify this. So, statement number one, hard term limits, you're out no matter what after a certain number of terms, two terms. Statement number two, preference for, two ter preference for a newcomer after two terms, but potential for you to stay on. Are you abstaining from this, Alyssa? So, I, I, can't, I can't give that choice. So, I don't have that option. You just said no. So, the last thing we're going to vote on is raise your hand if you agree with the statement in cases where special training or expertise is required, longer periods of service may be appropriate. So, the reason I'm having trouble with this is I can't agree that it's a hard two terms and out, and I can't agree that preference for newcomers after two without the qualifier that it's because you have special expertise. So I, I wanted to separate that out I, because I wanted just pure agreement on that issue because I do think that's a slightly separate thing, but are, all these things are related. Right. So can I just say, can, I'm gonna read the statement, do we, because part of this is are we literally gonna adopt as part of our policy the appointed committee handbook language or are we gonna change it, which is what I'm trying to assess right now. And so the statement, in cases where special training or expertise is required, longer periods of service may be appropriate. Can you raise your hand if you agree with that statement? Okay. I just have a comment about that. I, th I would find it really unusual that if a person were on the planning board for six years that they wouldn't have experience and expertise. So why would that not apply to everyone finishing their second term? Mm -hmm. um, and so that would, be a, that would be an out for every single person. Um, so I find that crazy because that... Alyssa. Is, tell you that my practical experience is people don't always serve very well when they serve on committees. And so just showing up in which they didn't even necessarily show up doesn't mean they have the same skills and experience as someone who went to trainings, who did additional readings, who did additional research. They could have been there the same period of time and served very much less competently than the other person. And so therefore, I don't believe that that person can make the, the case that they have special training or expertise just because they were sitting in the seat. It would, be, it would be the committee that would be making the case if they wanted that person to continue. So well, that, could, that, that argument could be made for anyone. And they might not be making it for themselves. But anyway, okay. I'm just saying. Uh, Sarah? I would say that, that Alyssa's point is very valid, and I would say in that case, if we're going to if we're going to agree to that, I think OCA would also need to have, or we would have to have some kind of hard and fast evaluation of people who had served on committees for, you know, one or two years. I mean, I think that would also help us make up our minds. I think if we're going to take that into consideration, we actually need to know, or we need to have some parameters of what it means to. Um, be an, an excellent, productive member of a board or committee. Okay. So, I, George, do you have one last comment? Just quickly, there's no rule, as far as I know, of, of, of preventing us from speaking to staff and consulting them and getting their input and also speaking to current members of that body and getting their input. Okay. Okay. So, we're getting a little bit over time. Um, and so, I want to move on in the agenda with a reminder that we are going to return to this exact topic again in November. So this was our first discussion of it. So now you have a good month to sit there at home and use your free time to think about whether you agree with the straw votes you took today, whether you want to change it, whether you have new ideas, because um, we will return to this issue of term limits and the broader criteria of a healthy multiple member body, which we didn't get to get to everything. Uh, agenda item five is discussion of the 923 report to town council. It, uh, there is a report that's in the town council packet. It is also in our reports folder. 
um, and it details the request that we are making of the council to separate out the CAFs um, and in, in some level of detail, the rationale that we have for doing that. Uh, that will not necessarily be voted on tonight um, in the council, um, but I will be the focus of my OCA report um, with hopefully some feedback from the councilors on this. Um, and of course, I will be giving a brief oral report to just say we voted unanimously to recommend to register our voters. Are there questions about the report tonight, Alyssa? I don't think it was posted adequately for us to be able to vote on it tonight. I'm not saying we were mm -hmm. inadequate. I'm just saying I don't think it conceived of the fact that we might be ready. Yeah. Yeah, I think my hope is for 10-7. Um, so that's that. I, I want to say also if you look in your uh, packet, you'll see the OCA Fall 2019 agenda schedule. The, uh, we don't have to discuss this. We're not going to discuss this right mm -hmm. now. Um, but this is, if you have any question about where I'm going with things or how I plan to actually organize things, this is my intention for our currently scheduled meetings, the topic for each meeting, what we'll be doing, um, because I realized that you showed up today and unless you had read the packet ahead of time, by which I mean sometime after I posted it at like 9 p.m. last night, um, you had no idea what we're actually going to be talking about other than just discussion of the appointment process. So I want to make sure you're aware what, is, what part of the appointment process we likely will be discussing in every meeting. This is a draft. It will likely change. Notice October 7th, we'll also be talking about the ZBA vacancy. Um, and then we've, because we keep getting things thrown at us, um, we also are responsible for town council appointment of liaisons. And I have put that, I'm going to be putting that uh, tentatively on our October 21st agenda. George? Thank you for doing this. And if, if anyone has any questions or comments, you can speak to me um, individually. If you see something like, wait, we need to do this and that's not here, mm -hmm. maybe that's what Alyssa is about to say. No, can you just oh. tell me what the word interviews means when it's a sub bullet? Yeah. Uh, it, um, that everything that has to do with interviewing candidates. So that's. I have three. I wondered meetings. about that too. Right. So, <laughs> are we interviewing someone? No, no, no. These are the, the topics that we're discussing. So, um, the question of how we're going to about go about scheduling and conducting interviews of candidates. I put that for three meetings because I think that will likely be the most contentious and um, uh, time-consuming part of our discussion is how we go about interviewing candidates before we bring them forward. Uh, Darcy. Do you have a question? Um, what, what, did, what were we asked to do about liaisons? Uh, we are making the recommendation to the council on who gets what committees. Really? Yeah. It's uh, per the charter, liaisons are a town council appointment, and town council appointments go through OCA. Ah. So we have real power now. So cool. yes. So yeah. that will be October twenty-first. Okay. Uh, is there any public comment? If you could just come up and use the mic so we can get it for the camera. Is it on? Yes, Correct, it yes. Arkeen Amherst Indy, uh, just a request that you post the packet so it's accessible to the public before the meeting. I know you only had a chance to send it out to your colleagues at 9 o'clock last night. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is hard to follow what's going on when you're referring to documents, and I can't see them. So um, please post the packet, and I'll make a request to you, Evan, that I could see some of those documents before we go to press at the end of the week. Okay. Thank okay. you for your comment. Okay, there are no top. So it's an unanticipated mm -hmm. item. I completely <laughs> object to the idea that you would provide any additional information to the press that isn't what this needs to be, and as I've described to, mis to public commenters before, this is a problem with town resources. This is not our personal problem as part-time elected officials to figure out which press outlets want us to send them our packets ahead of time. It is the town should be providing, just as they do for the town council packet, they should be providing a place where we can easily upload our packets. That's not up to, just as it wasn't up to our previous chair, to to provide, and I, I object completely to the idea that we would individually do that. That needs to be done through the town where they say, here's the way, place you can put it, Evan, as chair, you can yep. put it on there and it'll be there for everyone. Everybody. It's not appropriate to have it be for some people who show up at a meeting and some people who don't. 
because it should be out there for the entire public. I completely agree. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa, for determining that topic not anticipated <laughs> for the chair. Um, I don't want to discuss this because um, you know, it wasn't part of our agenda and it's not really part of our, our charge. Um, so with that, only 10 minutes late, we are going to adjourn the meeting at 11.40 a.m.